So Venn diagrams are a visual representation when we're using our probabilities. So since basic calculations within probability involves counting the number of outcomes that fit into a particular event, it makes sense to have a visual tool to use to keep track of this sample space that we get from that. So the way we keep track of the sample space is by creating a Venn diagram, and it lets us organize our data. So consider the integers from 1 to 10. So those would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. When they give you something like that, that is what we refer to as the universe for this problem. So all we're dealing with within this problem are their numbers 1 through 10. As far as this problem is concerned, no other numbers exist. <coughs> Just 1 through 10. So A is the set of all integers that are even. And B are all of the integers that are multiples of 3. So before you create your Venn diagram, it's easiest to actually make the list of what those numbers are within your sets. So A being the even integers, that means it would be 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. B is the set of the multiples of 3, so what would those numbers be? 3, 6, and 9. So when you go to create your Venn diagram, you always want to fill in the little middle part first. You want to fill in this part here where your two circles overlap. And what goes in that section of it is what they have in common. So what numbers do they share in common? Six. The 6. So we're going to put a 6 there. And then they don't have any other numbers in common. So in my set A, I'm going to put the rest of them, 2, 4, 8, and 10. Well, because for some reason my line got cut off, that's actually a B. So what am I going to put in the other part of my B circle? The 3 and the 9. So then if I go back up here to my universe, cross out the numbers that we used within set A and set B. What numbers are we left with? So those go outside of the circles. Because they're still part of the problem, they're just not within set A or set B. So they go on the outside in the box. So that's our Venn diagram. Within the Venn diagram, there's usually two things that they're looking for mainly, and that's the union and intersection of your two sets. So the union is everything combined. When they're looking for the union, they'll also use the word or, or they will use this little U symbol. So they'll say A, U, B. The way we read that is A, union, B. <coughs> so within our Venn diagram, I got my two circles here. My union, oops, I don't want it that big. But the union is everything in the circles. Nothing outside of the circles. That's not going to erase it, of course. So union, everything in the circles put together. Our inter intersection here, that's what they have in common. Your intersection is the word and, or that little symbol that looks like an N. So we would read that as A intersection B. So that would be what the numbers have in common. So like in our example up here, our intersection would be the number 6. That's what the two sets had in common. So in our Venn diagram, the intersection, whenever they ask for your and, is just that little piece right there in the middle. So 
So under our find the following, we've got these little ends on the outside of here. That N means number of elements. So they don't want you to write the full sample space of what is in there. They just want to know how many things are in there. So the number of elements in set A, so if you look at your circle, how many numbers are in the A circle? Come on. We got one, two, three, four, five. Five numbers are in our A circle. How many numbers are in our B circle? Three. A union B, how many are in both circles combined? Seven. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the next one, number of elements in A intersection B, one. They had one thing in common. <coughs> so then they want to know why is the following equation not true? Explain. So they want to know why the union of A and B, which we found to be seven elements, doesn't equal the set A plus B. Well, we know this is five plus three. That's eight. So seven does not equal eight. Can anybody think they figure out why that doesn't work? your intersection twice. So the 6 was counted twice. It was counted as part of set A. It was counted as part of set B. So if you just add those together, you're adding the 6 in there twice. You can't do that. So our general rule of probability, or probability law, I should say, Makes it sound a little bit more important. Our general probability law is the number of elements in A union B equals the number of elements in set A plus the number of elements in set B. And then we have to subtract from it the number of elements in A intersection B, since that is what was counted twice, was their intersection. So then using our numbers from above, A would be 5, B would be 3, and then you subtract the one intersection that they had. That's how we get our 7. So now it would be a true statement. <coughs> and then down below, sometimes it does happen. Events A and B have no successful outcomes in common. Then if you're trying to do the union of them, you would just add the two of them together if they have absolutely nothing in common. We call those mutually exclusive or disjointed events. So they are in no way related to each other. They have nothing in common. So our Venn diagram for something like that would just be two circles that are not overlapping. They would just be two completely separate circles. So we would know that's a mutually exclusive scenario. Questions so far? All right. So we have, suppose that 230 students play soccer, and then 190 students play basketball, 60 students play both sports, and there's a total of 500 students at the school. So first thing they want us to do is they want us to fill in the Venn diagram. <coughs> so as I said, you always want to fill in your middle first, your intersection. So how many students play both? So we're going to put a 60 right here. 
60 students would fall in that middle section. They play both soccer and basketball. So next to fill in the other circles. We have 230 students who play soccer. However, 60 of them uh, we've already put in the Venn diagram because they also play basketball. So we've got to subtract that 60 from the 230. So we get 170 who play soccer only. So they go in this part of the circle. So that means those are the people who only play soccer. So then how many of them only play basketball? 130. So we got 130 students who play only basketball. So now what we have to do is we have to figure out the outside, how many don't play soccer or basketball. You got it? It's not. Yeah, so you've got to subtract those three in the Venn diagram, the 170, the 60, the 130. So it's going to be 140. Don't play soccer or basketball. So once you have the Venn diagram filled in, usually it's pretty easy to answer the questions. B, how many students play basketball but not soccer? 130. That would be this part of the circle here. Basketball only. Suppose that a student will be selected at random from the school. What is the probability that the selected student plays both sports? Let's do it as a fraction first. 60 out of 500, which would in fact be 0.12. So the other way you can fill in your Venn diagrams, you can use your number counts like we did in the top part here. But you can also fill them in using the probabilities. So sometimes you'll see your Venn diagram done that way. <coughs> this is all the same problem. They want you to fill in the probabilities, though. We just found the probability that they play both sports to be 0.12. So we're going to put that in the middle. So let's figure out the probability that they play just soccer. We said it was 170 over 500. Would give us what? So 0.34 would be just soccer. What would be our probability for basketball? 0.26. And then our last one, the probability of neither. 0.28. Again, we just took all of our numbers from above, divided them by 500, since it was all out of 500 students. That gives us our probability for our Venn diagram. So three, what is the probability that a selected student plays either sport? So if they play either sport, that means we're looking for an or. So using that formula I gave you last time for our or, the probability that they play A, which in this case we'll say A is soccer, B is basketball. I'm going to change that one to an S because we use S's and B's, not A's and B's. Now, we can't really get these numbers from the Venn, well, we can, but it's not sticking right out. The probability that they play soccer is all of this circle. So you would have to add those together. What's the probability they play soccer? 0.46. Basketball would be all of this circle. That's 0.38. And then we have to subtract the 0.12. Because that's the intersection. You always, first one plus the second one minus their intersection. <coughs> so then subtract those, see what we get. because it's all of this circle, so it's the 0.34 plus the 0.12. What'd you get, Paul? That's what I got. Hopefully that's what everybody got.
anybody else think they know another way they could have done this without using the general rule? Since you already had the Venn diagram made, all you had to do was add all of the numbers within the circle. And that would also give you 0 0.72. Unless they specifically tell you you have to use the general rule. But yes. All right, let's take a look at the next page. So here we have suppose that 62% of books are works of fiction. 47% are available as e-books. And 14% are available as e-books but are not works of fiction. They want us to fill in the Venn diagram first and then we're going to answer a couple of questions. So with the Venn diagrams, you cannot put percentages in them. So when we use this, we should use the decimal forms of them. Those are our probabilities. But did they tell us our middle section works of fiction and ebooks? Did we get that percentage yet? No. So which percentage do you think we should work with first? Yes, the 14, because it says 14 are available as ebooks, but not works of fiction. So that's means that they're ebooks only, which means it would just be this part of the circle over here. So 14% as a decimal would be 0.14. So then, since we're still working with ebooks, I know 40% of them are ebooks. 14% are ebooks, but not fiction. So what would be our middle part? How could we find that out? Yes, we got to subtract. 47 minus our 14 would give us 33%. So that would be 0.33. So now that we know our middle, we can find the other part of our fiction. They said fiction total was 62%. We now know 33% of them are fictions and ebooks. So what would be fiction only? Very good, point 0.29. And then since this one's dealing with probabilities, to figure out our outside, it would be 1 minus the numbers in your circles. Because the highest probability you can have is 1. So 1 minus all of those will give us our outside. Which would be point two four. All right. So now using the Venn diagram, find the probability that a s randomly selected book will be a work of fiction and available as an ebook. No. Fiction and ebook. Would be the point three three. Remember, that's your middle. Where these two circles meet, that's fiction and ebook. And then what's the probability that it's neither a work of fiction nor an ebook? 0.24. That means it's outside of the circles. So now this information from our Venn diagram can also be used in a hypothetical 1,000 table like we did last time. So they want us to show this information in one of these tables. So I know that total needs to be 1,000 because that's why it's called a hypothetical 1,000 table. So it says 62% of the books are fiction. So how many are actually fiction? 620. So my fiction total is 620. 47% are ebooks. So what's 47% of 1,000? Yeah, so ebook total is 470. And then ebook, but 
but not fiction, 14%. So how many of those? 140. So ebook, not fiction, right here is 140. So now we can find the rest of our numbers. 470 minus 140 would give us 330, which if you remember from our Venn diagram up above, it was 33%, which would be 330. How many are fiction but not ebook? Which again, that was our 0 0.29 times 1,000, 290. How many are not ebook, not fiction? What was it? 240. So that would make this 380. And what's our last total? 530. So there's that information in our hypothetical thousand table. Which, by the way, we have a quiz after vacation. Hypothetical thousand table, definitely on that quiz. So make sure you know that. <laughs> All right, next example down here. We have a company. 43% of the employees have access to a fax machine. 38% have access to a fax machine and a scanner. And then 24% have access to neither a fax machine nor a scanner. So remember, again, we can't use the percentages. We have to use them as decimals instead when we put them in our table or in our Venn diagram here. So which number should we use first? Okay, where's our 24% going to go? Outside. So 0.24 goes on the outside. Which one should we go with next? The 38. Where's our 38 going to go? In the middle, because that was our and. Fax machine and scanner in the middle. So now we got to go with our 43 number next. But we're not actually going to put 43 in here. What are we going to put over here? Ooh, nope. There it is, 0 0.05. Yep. So then how are we going to find our last number? Yep, 1 minus all three of them, or you could add all three of them up and then subtract from 1. Either way, you would still get the same answer. No. Yeah, that wouldn't just be it. Because it's already set up in the Venn diagram, we don't have to do that this time. So we got to make sure we actually answer the question, though. And they want a probability that a randomly selected employee will not have access to a scanner. Yep. So if they don't have access to a scanner, that means they could be out here or in this part of the circle of a fax machine. So what would be our probability that they do not have access to a scanner? 0 0.29. The 0 0.24 plus the 0 0.05. So 0 0.29. All right, one more. So we got Evie was doing a science fair project by surveying her biology class. She found that of the 30 students in her class, 15 had brown hair, 17 had blue eyes, and 6 had neither brown hair nor blue eyes. Determine the number of students who had brown hair and blue eyes. Very carefully. So let's figure out what number can we deal with first. 
the six. Where are we going to put the six? Outside. On the outside. What do we want to do next? <coughs> well, where's the 17 going to go? But remember, that 17 also has the people with brown hair and blue eyes. So what we want to do for this, I'm going to show you two ways that we can figure this answer out. One way, add up the three numbers that you do know, the 15 plus the 17 plus the 6. What do we get? 38. So subtract our total number of students, which was 30. That leaves us with 8. So that means 8 is the ones that have brown hair and blue eyes. Because remember, they were counted here and here. So whatever the extra is are the kids who were counted twice. So it was 8. So then that means this would be 7 because 15 minus 8 would give us 7. That side over there would be the 9 because 17 minus 8 gives us 9. The other way we can find this out is by using our general probability rule. So the probability of A or B would be what? Well, let's see here. We had 30 students total. We knew absolutely six of them were not going to fall in either of these categories. So how many should have been in these circles? 24. So A or B should have equaled 24 between the two of them. We knew A was 15, B was 17, and we were trying to find the two of them together, so that would be our X. So 15 plus 17 gives us what? 32. Subtract my 32 over, I get a negative 8 equals negative x. So positive 8 equals positive x. So there were 8 kids that had both blue eyes and brown hair. That's the other way you could figure it out. 